it's online as well. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to welcome Sri Sharma to this seminar. Uh, Sri is a professor in biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins. Um, she did her undergraduate at Cornell and then her master's and PhD at MIT, all in engineering, biomedical engineering, electrical, electrical engineering. And uh, she is one of the world experts on advanced electrical uh, analysis of neural signals and epilepsy and in the mechanisms and using control theory to understand epilepsy and Parkinson's, right? So all over to Sri. So she'll tell us today about epilepsy and epilepsy. Thank you, Sarishan. That was such a compliment given that this is the real leader in <laughs> neural signal processing and epilepsy that has happened. So wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so just this is, you know, um, I I really try to uh, cater to the broad audience. I can go deep, shallow, doesn't matter. If you have questions, just raise your hand and no worries. It's informal and I just want to make sure we're following and that's it. Okay. So I'm going to talk about um, uh, basically what I'm going to talk about today is sort of a, a framework, sort of the method approach that we use when it comes to modeling imaging data. And we're, I'm gonna show you today how one sort of class of models allows us to glean very unique properties of epileptic networks that give us interesting new markers for epileptogenicity in the brain. Okay, so that's where I'm gonna take us today. Okay, so in case not, as some of you may not be familiar, just a very high level background. So over 60 million people in the world have epilepsy. It's defined by these um, events that are recurrent, unprovoked, um, not always predictable. Um, electrographically, it's this sudden change in of electrical activation in the brain where you have areas of the brain that might be hyperactive and synchronized. And this is just an example of sort of a electrical intracranial EEG and what that looks like in a few channels in the brain for a C uh, epilepsy patient. Um, now, I don't know how many of you know this, but actually 30% of all patients with epilepsy actually don't respond to drugs. They're what are called medically refractory, they med have medically refractory epilepsy. And so the gold standard for treatment for these patients, because we still have to figure out ways to suppress their seizures or control their seizures, is surgery. Okay, and so the idea, oh, let me try to get into the surgery. Uh, well, let me tell you, the idea of surgery is to find out where your seizures are starting and spreading and somehow either remove that tissue or disconnect that tissue to sort of suppress seizures. That's sort of surgical resection is what they call it. Now, not everybody who has medically refractory epilepsy are candidates, right? So they have different kinds of epilepsy, generalized where a seizure might start and almost spreads throughout rapidly versus focal where the seizures might start and spread more in a localized area. It's not always one structure. It could be a group of regions, you know, a small network, um, but it's still focal. And these are possible candidates of surgery because it's contained and the clinicians and the neurosurgeons can go in there and resect that tissue in hopes of stopping the seizures. Um, and about 50% of people have MLB have focal, so therefore they're possible candidates for surgery. Um, there's a notion what we call of what part of the brain is causing seizures. There's different sort of languages. So one that we can adopt is seizure onset zone, which is exactly which region of the brain or regions are actually starting the seizure. You also have what are called early spread regions where it starts and then spreads early. And collectively, some people call that the epileptogenic zone. So resection of, I talked about surgical resection. The hope is that you get seizure freedom. That's not always the case. Um, or you can also do laser ablation where you just make certain lesions. Um, if it's, if you feel like, uh, if the clinicians feel like just small lesions will actually be therapeutic. So now one problem with this is surgery, despite, and I'm gonna tell you about how they try to find this onset zone is very laborious. They collect a lot of data from the patient, um, but despite all that, surgical success rates on average in the United States is around 50%. They're highly variable. 30% is the worst case, 30% meaning seizure control or seizure freedom versus 70% or 80% a chance. And what makes, you have to do one We just pause for one second sure. while we switch the camera from one yeah, computer yeah. to the other. Sure. Yeah. Got 
yeah. Excellent. Okay. And let me just get on. Sorry, we we apologize for this. We just had a computer that decided to update in the middle of. <laughs> I don't have it on my slide. What I was going to say is, you know, what makes you a candidate that has a 70% chance of success versus 30? The 70%, 80% are people who have lesions. So they have particular structural abnormalities in the brain that you can detect with an MRI scan. Um, they also, when they're monitored in the epilepsy monitoring with scalp EG for several days, and they eventually have seizures. Those seizures are starting in the location near that lesion. So there's correspondence, a little more data that says, okay, that's probably where seizures are starting. And in some cases, they go into what's called invasive monitoring, which I'm gonna show you here, where you capture intracranial EG for several weeks, waiting for the patient to have seizures. And then when they see that the intracranial EG is also starting in that location, all the data corresponds. And that's when the clinicians have a very high confidence that, okay, we take this out this is likely to be a surgical success. So that's kind of the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is there's nothing in the MRI scan, not necessarily correspondence. You have to put a lot of electrodes to because you're not sure where things are happening. And you may or may not see as many seizures as you need to really identify this onset zone and spread. We're all good. We're good? Okay, fantastic. So this is what invasive intracranial EEG monitoring looks like. There's different techniques. The idea is you want to put I electrodes either on the surface of the cortex or inside the brain. And you want that, that's just a surgery to get the implant that makes the patient recovers, stays in an epilepsy monitoring unit for several weeks, and the clinical team is waiting for that patient to have seizures. So I show both methodologies here. So this is electrocortic You can see grids on the uh, grid of electrodes on the surface of the cortex. So you need a craniotomy to do that. There's a technique that's becoming much more widely adapted in the United States. It was already you know, uh, used in Europe probably Canada as well, stereotactic EEG. So here you don't do a craniotomy. You just have small burr holes and you put depth electrodes into these holes. And you can, usually it's unilateral because the clinicians have an idea of what side of the brain the seizures might be starting on. But on each of these electrodes, there's 10 to 16 contacts. And so you'll get multiple structures sort of local field potential activity. The patient recovers from that surgery and his monitor stays in an epilepsy monitoring unit in the hospital for typically two to three weeks. Why? Because as I mentioned, the clinical team is waiting for them to have seizures. So they typically on medications, they start tapering them off when they go in and then they're kind of no medication for a while and they're hoping to see seizures. They wanna at least see three. And what they do is through visual inspection, you'll see a seizure, they'll start looking channel by channel and saying which channels are, you know, exhibiting something that's abnormal and they have various, you know, models of what abnormalities are. And then they say, okay, I see something happening in this channel, this channel, this channel, that corresponds to this region and that's where we want to do the surgery. Okay. And with all of that, it's still grim results, I would say. And so what we're going to, um, what we are planning is that, you know, not all failures are due to the fact that the clinicians got it wrong. Okay, this is a very complex disorder. Clinicians could very well be very accurate in identifying where seizure starts and try to treat it, and then other things can go wrong and, and seizures can return. Other areas can become epileptogenic and so forth. So it's not always about that, but we certainly think we can improve in coming up with better ways to identify where do seizures start. Another approach we think we're gonna we're gonna show talk about later is can you now that you have electrodes in the brain you can actually stimulate and clinicians do that they stimulate the regions because when they stimulate they do that typically at the end of the monitoring phase because they want to make sure like if, that they're when they do the surgery that they're not going to cause impairments right motor visual and so forth so they stimulate to see okay are they talking or are they able to read when I stimulate that how about their vision and so forth that's called functional mapping. But we are going to talk about how we can look at stimulating the brain to understand seizure dy uh, dynamics to help localize and identify where seizures start. Okay, so that's kind of a high level background approach. So I'm gonna take you back to calculus because what I'm gonna now introduce is the literally the class of models that we're gonna use throughout to study the brain. Okay, so I'm gonna start with calculus, right? So we're, we're, we're gonna definitely move into sort of networks, okay? And thinking of the intracranial EEG as I'm getting partial observations from the epileptic network from these EEG signals. 
but I'm going to start with a network of one node. So I have x dot equals ax. Okay, you can think of that as a single node, one region. It's not interacting with anybody else. And the self-loop is A. A is a constant, and A dictates what x of t will look like, right? So I have a differential equation, x dot equals ax. What's the solution? It's exponential. x of t for all time is e to the at, x naught in a time's mm -hmm. initial condition. And depending on the value of A, you're either decaying or you're increasing, right? So that's one node. Now let's add a little bit of complexity. Let's add, make this a two-node network, okay? I'm sticking to the simple linear time invariant model. Linear, because it's constant, a, x dot equals ax. Time invariant, because a doesn't change with time, okay? And so now if I have two nodes, now the two nodes can talk to each other and influence each other with these aij's, and they still have their subgroups. Now, now a is a matrix, it's two by two. And, and some of you may know, it's actually the eigenvalues of that matrix that dictate what the solution x of t looks like. x of t now has two variables, x1, x2. And depending on where those eigenvalues are, you might see oscillations. You might see decaying oscillations, growing oscillations. You can have all kinds of solutions, okay? So you actually get quite rich behavior just by adding a second node. Now, if you consider even a more complicated an n node network where n nodes are interacting and so forth. That's when things start looking much more rich in terms of the types of signals that can come out, even with an x dot equals as, okay? And for the same, in terms of what dictates what these signals look like, the eigenvalues of that matrix. So my claim is that matrix A carries a lot of information, we're gonna talk about what, what we can glean from this A, about network dynamics, okay? And so that's what we're going to try to exploit in trying to come up with markers of epileptogenicity. Okay, so we're going to use the language, we're going to call this dynamic network model. Why dynamic? Because it's x dot equals ax. I'm trying to predict future activity from present activity. Okay, so not to confuse this A matrix with functional connectivity. So maybe some of you who do neuroscience and look at imaging data, you have many the time series, many signals, and you can look at pairwise correlations or coherence and so forth and build what's called a connectivity matrix that says, how do, does this region correlate to that region? That is not what this is. Because a correlation matrix, a connectivity matrix cannot generate data. This is a model that if I have A, I can actually simulate EEG. Okay, so there's a little bit of a difference there. Okay. So with that said, um, the claim is that this very simple model can actually reveal properties of epileptogenicity. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today are three different markers gleaned from this type of model. One is neural fragility. So ICTO means seizure. So what we're, that particular marker is going to want to see snapshots of seizures. So it's looking at the intracranial EG during seizure to basically say where do seizures start. Okay. So that's that marker. Then we're going to say, okay, but what if I don't see a seizure? Let me take five minutes or a few minutes of a snapshot of the intracranial G when they're just at rest. They're not seizing. Can I take that data and say, where do seizures start? So we have an approach to that. We call that source sync. That's another marker, okay? But it's a dip where the brain is not seizing. Finally, if we have time, I'll talk about resonance. The time where there are clinicians are actually putting in pulses into stimulating one region of the brain and measuring the responses of those, we're gonna look at that data, the response data, and try to say where seizures start, okay? So we're after the same goal. In all three cases, I'm trying to pinpoint this onset zone, but I'm using different data, different data in terms of conditions of the brain to do it, okay? But the same model. That makes sense so far? Okay. So what is this model and how do we get it from data? So imagine I have some, you know, intracranial EEG, for example, what we're going to talk about intracranial today. So every channel is a, gives me a signal, okay? And what I'm going to do is take a very, look at a very small window, in this case, say 500 milliseconds, and I'm going to assume that in that 500 millisecond window, the brain is linear time invariant. We know that the brain is not linear and it's not time invariant, probably not time invariant, okay? But in this tiny little window, we argue that it is. And, I'll, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in that it can reconstruct that data, okay? 
But in that window, what we do is a very simple least squares type estimation to say from the data, can I estimate this A matrix, right? So I have N by N unknowns, and I'm gonna use that data in that window to estimate this, okay? And then what we're going to do is once we have an estimate of that A, so that model in that window is that A matrix, I'm gonna slide that window and repeat, and I'm gonna get another A matrix, okay? And I keep going through the recording, and at the end of the day from a single recording, I have a sequence of A matrices. So we've converted a snapshot, say 10, a few minutes of EEG, to a sequence of matrices. And that sequence of matrices is what I'm calling our model. Now it's linear because it's all linear here, but it's time varying in that the A is changing over time. So what we've essentially built here is a linear time varying model of the EEG data, okay? So now just as an example of how well the model reconstructs, so this is a snapshot um, of five seconds of data, just to show you that the real data is in the blue and our model is in the red. And no, our model is, we let it run. Okay, we simulate it and it's able to at least capture what's going on. And that is enabled through the time bearing aspect of this, this model. Okay, so this model seems to replicate the data. Let's see what it can tell us in terms of epileptogenicity. Okay, so the first marker is fragility. Okay, this is where we're looking at right before and during seizure events to try to find where seizures start, okay? So here's the concept of fragility. Everything we do in the lab is we first try to hypothesize what we think is happening. So I talk about three markers, seizure, at rest, and after I stimulate, right? And in each of those conditions, we have to hypothesize, what we did is we hypothesized what do we think is happening in the epileptic brain in that window, in that snapshot. And then what we're gonna do is once we build the models, we're gonna look for that property. So what do we think for it during seizure? Here's what we think. We think that if you have a, a healthy brain or you're not seizing, that the brain is somewhat balanced in health, meaning I have inhibitory populations, excitatory populations in the brain, and if I flash a light, your visual cortex areas will respond, it'll change the activity, but eventually it's balanced where it's stable and it'll go right back to rest. I perturb the system, it activates, goes right back to rest. That's a nice, balanced, stable network, okay? And this is what we think is happening in health. But in epilepsy, especially focal epilepsy, this was our hypothesis. We said, well, something caused an imbalance in that network. So just take an example of that single node, those connections that are in red, our, our claim is that if that is an area that started seizures, then that means it's small, some of those structural and functional connections have changed such that it causes imbalance in the network. That all of a sudden, if it's triggered with a perturbation at the wrong time, that whole network will go and say it's stable and cause a seizure phenomenon. Okay, and I'll, I'll quantify this shortly. Okay. And so, what we're calling fragility or neural fragility is the following we're going to say that a particular node in that network is fragile, okay, if the following is true that if I take that node when it's balanced and I just say, okay, how much do I need to change its connections? to its neighbors before I destabilize the stable network, how much do I need to do that before I destabilize? If I just need to change the connections and tweak them just a little bit, that is a very fragile node, right? Because I'll just tiny little changes will cause a stable network to go unstable. But on the other contrast that to a node that I have to make huge changes to my connections, okay? Before I destabilize, that's robust. That's not a fragile node. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna talk about how do we quantify fragility of a node? It's gonna come from that A matrix, that model. And then our hypothesis is that the most fragile nodes in the network are epileptogenic. That's the seizure onset zone. Okay, so that was our hypothesis. So to get into the mathematics of fragility, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples. Okay, so let's go back to that two node network. Okay, so I have an A matrix. I have a simple X that equals AX model. I have, a, I can draw it this way, where you can see the AIJ elements, three, negative three. I have an inhibitory node, so it's, it's sort of influenced to the other node is negative. Okay, so I'm dampening the activity, and then I have an excitatory node coming that way. And I'm gonna define a notion of size of a perturbation. So I'm not perturbing anything here, we're gonna get to that. But essentially, if I take that model and I apply a pulse, I stimulate with a pulse on that node, what happens? 
How, how did the model respond? Well, okay, both of the signals will respond to that pulse, but eventually go back to zero. Why? Because that is actually a stable system. That A matrix has eigenvalues that magnitude less than one. It's stable, meaning I can perturb it, but it will always go back to rest. So now I have a nice stable two node network. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to start the, asking the question of how fragile is this inhibitory node? Okay, so how am I gonna do that? I'm gonna add a small perturbation. I'm gonna make this node a little bit less inhibitory. Okay, so how do I do that? I add a plus one here and a plus two there, arbitrary. Okay, so I'm adding that to that first column. First column represents this node here, the first column of A. So I'm adding that, and what I'm gonna do, sorry, is quantify that perturbation. So what have I done? I've added this vector plus one, two to that first column. Think of a vector one, two, look at its norm. One squared plus two, two squared square root. So the square root of five gives me a notion of the size of that perturbation, okay? And then I can say, okay, if that's my new network, this new perturbed network, what happens when I kick that with a pulse? Well, guess what? I get more, a little bit more of a response, a longer response, it's still stable. It's still going to zero, okay? So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna add a more, a higher perturbation. I'm gonna make those, change those connections. I get even more, I'm gonna make it even less inhibitory, okay? I added a two and a two now, okay? The size of that perturbation is square root of eight. If I kick it now, I go unstable, okay? So what have I just shown you? I just showed you through example is, this is how we compute fragility. I, I start with an A matrix that is stable. And then for a given node, let's say this is node one, I'm, I'm gonna look at that column of the A matrix and I'm gonna perturb it until I get the smallest perturbation that destabilizes the network, okay? Now, so what we do is we did build, develop the theory to show how do you do that in general? We don't do that through trial and error. It's an optimization. It actually, some, some, after some nice uh, linear algebra matrix perturbation theory, you can show you can do it through least squares. So you can get in less than a second, you can get the fragility of every single node. So I have one A matrix and I can compute fragility on every single node. Is that, is that clear? Yeah. So what is a node? Oh. Is, is the, are the recorded contacts a subset of the total number of nodes? Yeah. No, so each contact we're assuming is a node. And that's all the nodes are a contact. So you're not so, modeling unmeasured nodes. We're, yeah, we're only taking measured observations. And so a node co corresponds to a specific channel. And how is that justified when the net real network obviously also includes things you're not measuring? Right, right. So they, there's the limitation of this approach is that we're, we're hoping, first of all, that the clinicians covered enough of brain for us to, that the easy, the epileptogenic area is in the coverage and these are just partial observations and we're just, I mean, so it is, so there will be cases and you'll see what happens to fragility when the clinician probably didn't cover the epileptogenic zone. Fragility is a relative measure. Okay, it turns out we normalize, so it's a relative measure. If I don't have an epileptogenic region in the network and I'm taking these observations, mm -hmm. it's from the seizure, but I didn't record seizure, all the fragility is comparable. And we, we you'll see, we, we start displaying fragility as heat maps. Now, let me show you an example. So what we do is we're, we're looking at fragility over that seizure window. So remember, I have a different A matrix for every 500 milliseconds. So we track fragility over time, and we can look at sort of the average fragility as the seizure starts, okay? And we can turn that number, yeah? Sorry, I'm going back to your previous slide. Would you expect that the direction of your kind of perturbation vector to be important? Because here you're just measuring the, the size, right? Yeah. But assumably if you changed like just the the like the the um, JJ, for example, or I guess II. Yeah, um, you, you made this may no, it will it, it so it turns out the the metric is uh, independent of sign, mm -hmm. but stability is not. Okay. Yeah. So you have, yeah, so a minus two and a minus two won't make this thing go unstable. Yeah, okay. Good. Yeah. Okay, so now I can take, take, here's an example. So this is a patient, um, this is ECOG, electrocortex is a bit old. Um, and this is a patient who actually had a successful, um, actually there's two uh, cases here, two successful uh, patients who have, both of them had successful surgeries. In this case, angle one, seizure freedom, actually, after they had their resections. And what I'm showing you here is the what are called implantation maps. So this is one patient, 
And these are where all the contacts were, okay? And what you see of the heat map is fragility, okay? That we computed by looking at seizure data coming from this patient, okay? And what's highlighted in black is what the surgeons treated, so the, the areas that they resected. And in this successful case, you can see that all the more fragile nodes were actually resected, okay? So there was nice correspondence between the surgical outcome and our fragility measure. Here's another case, same thing. They treated this area and that was the most fragile. So again, it looked like it corresponded. Now, one thing to keep in mind, there's no real ground truth labels here, okay? This is what makes this problem a bit hard. And no, I don't have the true onset zone labeled anywhere. So the best we can do is look to see, do we match the outcome, surgical outcomes? Uh, in success cases, do we match what the clinicians thought? And in failed cases, do we not match? And these are examples of failure cases. This is your case that I'm talking about. This is a case where we think that they did not cover the epileptogenic zone because everything was equally fragile there. But if you look to your left, and these are the, the left is left two images are the same um, patient, just different viewpoints. And what you can see here is what this is the part that was treated. Do you see my cursor? No. Yeah. Yeah. Did you see it? Okay. Um, so this this is the area that was actually treated. It was one of two of the least fragile nodes that we computed. Um, in fact, these were the more fragile areas and that was left uh, untreated. And this was indeed a failure case. Um, and this was also a failure case, um, but we didn't see anything. I mean, basically the conclusion was, we're not sure you covered the epileptogenic zone. So there seems to be a mismatch in these failure cases between fragility and what the clinicians um, actually treated. So yes. I'm a little puzzled. I I would think that the concept of fragility you're describing would refer to the interethral state. In other words, what when there is no seizure, can you learn about the network, about the nodes that look like they could trigger seizures? Now you're looking at the seizure itself. Right before, yeah. Yeah. But at this when the seizure has started. There are some regions that are active, having seeding, mm -hmm. and others that are not yeah. at that time. So are you not replicating what you see in the seizure discharge? In other words, you will, are you, I, I guess my question is, are you finding fragile nodes as the nodes in which the seizure starts? Or are you finding fragile nodes in region where there's no seizure activity Right at that time, or what is the correspondence? So, so what is the rationale for looking at the fragility right before the seizure started? Well, we actually look at it right before the seizure starts, and we continue modeling that A matrix into about the first third of the seizure. So we're not looking at the whole seizure. The first third, you mean 20, 30 seconds? Yeah, okay. depending on the duration of the of the seizure. Right. Yeah, so the first third. And we're and we're and we look at fragility over that time. So we actually, well, I don't know if I have it in here, but I do have, it. I'll show you the example in a few slides where we can now look at fragility over time as it enters the seizure and even exits out of the seizure. I'll show you some examples. The study we did is we wanted to see does fragility in that beginning phases, right before and, and right after onset, do the most fragile regions correspond to the clinically annotated SOZ? That was the question we didn't ask. And, and I can show you the result of that. Before the seizure, and, and so, it's a, so it's a very unstable, uh, unstationary yes. period. Yes. And so how can you give a measure that represents this whole period, which is so changing? Very excellent question. And I, I, I'm going to, so, so it's difficult. This is why we had to optimize what window do we need to look at to kind of really get at onset and that was before it actually started but i'm going to advocate despite this study and what we did and, and we, the results that we found which i'll show you i am not going to advocate using this marker for the real clinical uh, translation i'm going to do exactly what the interictal marker is something i'm much more excited and confident about because of the stationarity so many things happen. I mean, there's thousands and thousands of papers, including ours, at looking at seizure data and saying, okay, I'm gonna look at seizures and then tell you where seizures start by looking at the data, whether it's a machine learning approach or this, I'm 60,000 plus papers I actually found, right? 
Um, and the reality is there's okay, so there's results and so forth. But if you look at what's happening, there's lots of changes in the network. The dynamics are very complicated. It goes unstable and it this and then it changes over time throughout the seizure. But if you look between seizures, which is less, fewer people have looked at in a rectal resting state, things are quite stationary. And so that's where I would want to live if I'm going to make the claim. But you're absolutely right. And so the, the because of things changing so much, we actually have to carefully optimize the window over which we computed fragility to have it correspond. You know, but I'm with you and you're, I'm going to get to the inner adult marker. Yeah. So how do we sort of see how the correspondence? So the idea is we said, okay, we're going to think fragility is a good marker, carries information about the onset zone. If it agrees with the clinicians in successful cases, cases and disagrees in failure cases. And so we computed a statistic of agreement, okay? And so, and then from that statistic, we can threshold and say, okay, I'm going to now predict a success or failure based on this correspondence. And when you do that binary prediction, you get this type of ROC curve. Um, this was done on 91. So this is a retrospective study where we took 91 patients, on average, three seizure clips per patient, looked at fragility. They were treated at five different centers. And this particular case, just, okay. oh, oh, no worries. In this particular case, 44 out of the 91 uh, patients had successful surgery, 47 failed. So their operating point is 48% accuracy, just as a reference point. And we were able to show that we can improve on that. I think at least one utility of this marker, perhaps, is flagging failures, right? That, that, that's what I would maybe put my claim on in this. We compared it to lots of other markers proposed, looking at spectral power in different frequency bands, looking at network-based measure, graph theoretic measures, looking at coherence in different frequency bands and connectivity matrices, and fragility outperformed um, those on this very exact same data sets. Importantly, we also did a measure of interpretability, right? Even though the beta power had carried information for sure, that was the second that was the second highest um, performing uh, feature is just beta power in the same window. You look at the actual heat map. So this is the heat map I'm talking about. This is a snapshot in time. This is a seizure, onset, offset. And the left side is fragility on every channel. So the y, the y axis are channels. And you're looking at a feature over time. The left is fragility. The right is beta band power. And one of the things you can see is the interpretability of the map. You see a lot more contrast in fragility where you can clinicians can just look at the map and say, okay, right before seizure, these guys became fragile and this actually was fragile the entire time, right? And it's very hard to do with the beta map. You can't scale this. You can try to scale it and you're not going to get that same level of interpretability. So we were, we think that our thing was a little bit more fragility, a bit more interpretable. Okay. So I'm going to move on now to indirectal. That was a seizure marker, right? And I think it has its limitations, right? Because things change dramatically during seizure. So we wanted to go out and say, well, wait a minute. You know, if you have epilepsy and you have focal epilepsy, surely your brain is different than a healthy brain, right? And shouldn't I be able to catch some properties of this pathology in an epilepsy brain when you're simply at rest? And more, to get further, can I actually tell you where seizures are gonna start by just looking at your resting state data? Okay, so that's the question. And we're gonna use the same model, but looking at that A matrix differently to answer that question. Okay, so to get there, we ask this question. So I'm gonna ask you this question, okay? Which is, okay, I care about in-between seizures. So if you have epilepsy, why is it that you don't seize all the time? There could be many possible reasons. We we have one answer. What, what would you think? So if, just imagine you focal epilepsy, you have this area of the brain, its job is to overexcite, cause a seizure phenomena. What could possibly be happening if you're not seizing all the time? I mean, there's probably a window right after a seizure where something's different, right? It's exhausted or tired or there may be a sort of a, a uh, repression. Right. But I'm thinking it should be even 20 hours away from the seizure. 
three days away from seizure. You're yeah. not seizing. Why? Yeah, I have no idea. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, it's, but it's a very, it's a very general phenomenon. Okay. I mean, why don't you have thunderstorms all the time because you have a thunderstorm one day? Okay. Why don't you have earthquakes all the time because you have an earthquake or a heart attack or whatever? Right. So it's a very general phenomenon that you have seizures. You can call all these things seizures that occur occasionally in a system that obviously is abnormal. Right. But that doesn't mean that that system has to be in that abnormal state all the time. So I'm not sure right. I understand. The so, 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 well, so I agree with everything you're saying, but our hypothesis was that, that perhaps sort of our immune response to sort of some abnormality in that brain that's causing seizure could be inhibition. That other areas of the brain that can functionally influence the onset zone, maybe they're inhibiting. Maybe they're, so that's a hypothesis, right? That's just a hypothesis. Um, we looked into sort of some type of biological evidence. I don't have that slide here, but whereas is there a, you know, have other people seen this possible inhibition phenomena um, in epilepsy patients? So there's, there's, there's been uh, literature out there on um, if you take cortical tissue that's epile pathological, epileptogenic, that there's an excess of, um, so you have excess glutamate and you also have excess protein, a GTP that's supposed to remove glutamate from the extracellular space, that that's more of that is in the epileptic tissue. Things like this that were pointing to this possible mechanism of effective inhibition. Um, but that was just a hypothesis, okay? Um, maybe wrong, but that's what we're going on. So that was our hypothesis. So, it, so then we had to say, okay, if, if I have this epileptogenic zone and I'm not seizing, and we have these other areas of the brain that are holding it down, can I figure out how to quantify that? Okay, so my student here said, okay, I'm gonna look at that intracranial EEG network again, and I'm gonna define the notion of sources and sinks. A node is either a source or a sink, or something in between. So a source is a node that has a high influence on other great areas of the brain, but is not being influenced. So conceptually think of it as a lot of outgoing arrows, no incoming arrows. And the sink is the exact opposite, right? It's being heavily influenced by the network, but not influential, okay? And the hypothesis we had is the epileptogenic area, so onset zone, is that during, let's see, right before seizures, they're probably sources because they're actually able to influence the network. They can actually cause a seizure and, spread, and it can spread. So maybe there's sources before a seizure start. But when you are not even close to seizing, maybe intrictally, you know, maybe there's sinks. Something's holding them down, inhibiting them or influencing them so that they don't cause that seizure phenomenon. Okay? So the hypothesis, so, so what my student went after is, okay, from the intracranial EG, I'm gonna take a few minutes of intrictal data random. I don't need them sleeping or awake or intracranial discharges or anything. Just give me five minutes. I'm going to build my models and I'll talk about how we get, I'm going to find top sources. I'm going to find top sinks in the network. I'm going to look for the sinks that are top sinks that are highly connected and therefore can coordinate the seizure phenomena. Okay. And I'm going to look to see that the top sources are, are influencing those sinks, not anybody else in the network. Okay. And that, that collection is going to be the hypothesized epileptogenic zone. Okay, so that makes sense? So then the question is, how do I quantify a source sourcing? How do I quantify influence? And that's where we go back to our model, right? I have the sequence of A matrices. Now I'm estimating them in the in an intercultural period. And I'm going to just take it just as an example, just to show you how to compute sources and things. Think of an average influence matrix. So it's not the average A, it's average of the absolute value of A, okay? So each AIJ tells me how one node's present activity influences the future, okay, of activity. Let me break it down a little bit more. So remember, I'm going after, I need for every node in this network, every channel, I want a number that tells me how much of a sink you are or how much of a source you are. So how do I do that? So let's talk about node one. What does the first row of node one tell me? It actually tells me, if you remember the model is x of t plus one is a x of t, present, predicting future. 
So what this first row tells me is how does the present activity of the network influence the future of node one? So that's incoming arrows. So if I'm node one, my incoming arrows are dictated by the first row of that A matrix, okay? And similarly, if I want to know how node one influences the rest of the network, I look at the column, okay? So now what I can do is sinks are, are nodes that have a lot of high row norms. Their rows are high, but their columns are low. And I can quantify for every node. Literally, I can take the norm of the row vector that gives me a number, the norm of its column vector that gives me another number, and I can plot that into a 2D space. Okay, so every dot here corresponds to a channel or a node. How do I get to, you know, so for each node, how do I get this? So this axis is influenced by others. That's the incoming, that's the row norm. This is the column norm, okay? All green from the A matrix. And now what I can do is say, okay, if you're up there, you're a top source, right? Because you don't, you, you're not influenced by others, but you are influential, okay? And then similarly, if you're down here, you're saints, you're being highly influenced by others, but you're not influential, okay? A question in the chat. Oh, yes. I'm asking why self-connectivity is zero. Self-connectivity. You don't have to make it zero. You can keep it. She zeroed out the, the self-connectivity, but you can keep it in. It, well, and actually, that we did that analysis. It doesn't really change where the sinks are because you're adding the same to every single Okay. Yeah. Good. Sorry, I have a question. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so just curious, why would it be uh, better to take the absolute value rather than the signed value? Since that you the hypothesis is that the top sources are actually inhibited. inhibited. So we can't say from intracranial EEG that something is inhibiting or exciting. I mean, I know there are papers out there that say you can. I'm not sure. I'm not so convinced. So all I care about is influence. And I'm going to assume that if you are influenced that, I mean, I can't prove it's inhibition. So caveat, I can't prove it, but we will test it to see if this works. Yeah. That 2D space is just like an idealized graph. Um, so, the what, sorry? The 2D space graph, that's just an idealized graph. Yes, like, but I'll show you real data. Oh, do yeah. you, oh, I was gonna ask, do you see like spots where a, a node is both a source and a sink? You can't be by definition. Well, you can be in the middle. So if you, okay, so you cannot, okay, so, there's no such thing as being able to cross both. You can be up here. Yeah, you, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're basically saying if you're up here. Yeah. Uh, we never saw that in our coverage, in our patients. We never saw that. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We never saw that. But remember, these are very, they're not full brain coverage, right? They're just kind of taking whatever covers what they the hypothesize epileptic area, right? But I'll show you some real data so you can see. Okay, so actually this is an example. So what we did in this case, this is a patient who had um, angle one outcome, so seizure freedom. You see a small snapshot of some of the channels. We can't plot all the channels. What you're seeing here is channels. Heat map is sync index over time, okay? So to your point, actually, it's not the best example. It's pretty stationary, right? When a sync is high, it stays high. When a sync is low, it stays low. And if you, I'll, I, if I have time, I'll show you what this same index looks like right for report seizure. It goes all over the place. It very changed. It changes a lot. Oh, in this particular example, I'll show you what's in red, which I, I apologize if you can't see. The top three channels were, were, were clinically annotated as onset zone and treated. And this was, I believe, laser ablation. Um, this is the implantation map. L bar one through three, these areas were what the clinician said were epileptogenic. This is actually a very dark red. I think I have a zoom in here. Um, this is the only one that had a very high sync index, one of those three channels. But it did correspond to what the clinicians uh, treated. Interestingly, this is that map. So this is the real data. All the channels are in here. We color the channels that the clinicians uh, treated in red, okay? And notice, they are the top sinks. So this was one of our, this is our, our. I'm sure if you do epilepsy patients, right? You always have that one patient where every method works and that's your figure one. This is, this is where it works, right? So if we always start with this guy, because if it doesn't work on this, we have no hope that it's gonna work on any, any of the other patients. 
But yeah, this was a really nice fit that not only were they the top sinks, but who, who was influencing them? The very top sources, which was nice, okay? So really nice correspondence. This other example is a nice proof of concept because remember I told you there's no ground truth. But here's a case where you can sort of get to ground truth, which is when a patient has two surgeries. The first surgery in this case was a failure. They came back, did monitoring again, had a second surgery, and the second surgery was a success. Okay? So what I'm gonna, what we did is we took the first surgery monitoring data and we computed a zinc index, okay? Shown as a heat map here, okay? And what you'd have is the same 2D plot here. Now what I'm showing you here is the first surgery, I think I have animation here. The first surgery, they treated G. They treated that area, this electrode, okay? And that's in red. And you can see G is all over the place in our source sink map, okay? And that's that was a failed outcome. Then later they came back, clinicians treated M, and those are the oranges. You can see a lot of those oranges are our top sinks that are being influenced by the top sources. So here was a nice example where we could actually show that we can take the original data and show that what, when they finally got it right, it corresponded with our sourcing index, yeah. So it's a very naive question. I probably got it all wrong. I'm okay. confused. Okay. Shouldn't an epileptic onset zone be a source? So before, so our hypothesis, and I'll show you, I, I have it. I'm gonna show you in two slides. Right before a seizure, yes. Okay. But not in between. That was our hypothesis. Is that? Oh, because they are inhibited normally. That was okay. our hypothesis. So that's the argument. yes, okay. yes, that's right. But great question. I'm going to get to that, and then after, right after this. So then, what we did is we wanted to test this idea of: Do I have correspondence? If the sink index is high, does that match the clinically annotated epileptogenic zone or not? And I use that match again to predict outcome. In the actual paper, we actually. Um, predict whether every channel is either in or outside the easy. So we do that test as well. And so this was really nice because our accuracy close to 80% average. Um, we can see this is basically, we, we would take the sync index and put it through a logistic regression model to predict probability of six deaths of every patient. And this is the, the model probability. And this is the successes versus failures. So you see a nice separation. All of this is on validation data. So we do proper cross fold. Uh, validation. To your question, and I think your question well, earlier on is related, we just wanted to see, and we did this for 15 patients where we also had seizure data, and we just wanted to see what happens to the sink index. So this, this first snapshot, this is not continuous in time. So this gray bar, we just took a snapshot. This is interracial, okay, well before seizure. This is six minutes leading into seizure, okay? So you can see when you're interictal, this metric is nice and stationary. But the minute you start getting close to seizure, look what happened. These were our top sink. This was the top sink we had. They all turned into sources, what you're saying, right before the seizure. And then they start becoming sinks again, presumably because their network's trying to respond and stop this phenomenon. And then there's different things happening post-seizure, right? So we were also looked at and analyzed for the same patients, like what happens as you enter into seizure and so forth. And we saw the type of phenomena. But the sources remain sources. Yeah. So then there's part of the network that's maybe not even participating, but they do change in the seizure. So they might be part of trying to hold, you know, stop the seizure, but some of them don't change at all. They're not even involved. This is where the sign really comes in, right? If you're able to estimate the sign of the interaction. Well, this might just mean it's not involved, right? Because remember, they have a specific uh, coverage of the brain. They might be covering areas that have nothing to do with the network. That that that's being, uh, you know, that's involved in the seizure. <laughs> Any questions on that? I guess uh, one. Because one interpretation is uh, this uh, issue of uh, inhibition. But it could be something different, right? It could be related to the signal. It's because essentially we are estimating A from the signal. And maybe, I'm not saying that that's the case, but let's say that they have a lower amplitude or something because you, when there is no seizure, there is not much activity generated in that region. And then maybe this shows up as a low. So that's a really, so. Yeah, so one thing we did do, which I don't have here, is we wanted to see if the sync index correlates to other metrics 
um, looking at power in different frequency bands, amplitude, the energy in the signal, and so forth, and we didn't see striking correlations like that way. If it was as simple as, okay, the lower energy signals yeah. in a rectal, then that paper would have been published and it probably would have been gold standard in clinic today, yeah. right? Um, but everybody's different. And also all of this depends on coverage, right? And if they, they cover differently, you know, it's not clear. Um, but, but I'm not claiming that this is the it. This was our hypothesis. We came up with a way to test that hypothesis. It looks like it's showing some interesting trends and, and patterns. Needs more work. Yeah. You said yourself that you cannot say that it's in vision. Absolutely not. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't prove the hypothesis. We, uh, we proved that the idea influence. works. Yeah, we yeah. proved that the notion of influence yeah. works. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe with fMRI or something, something with a different modality, we might be able to test this better. Okay, one one more minute. Okay, so all I'm going to do, I'm not going to go through this study. Not one minute. You have a few minutes. Okay. Three four. Three four. I'm going to just tell you about this hypothesis because this is a more recent, and I think it's kind of cool. Um, and then I'll wrap up to give you just a flavor of what this is about. So this is a hypothesis where here's what we did. Remember, the last marker was I pinged, I put a single pulse into one area of the brain, one channel, and I look at the response. It's called single pulse electrical stimulation, and I'm looking at the cortical, cortical uh, evoke potential, CSEPs, that's the response. And I'm gonna look at that response data to see if I can say where seizures start. And this experiment was done, all of this is done with collaborations with clinicians. In particular, one of the neurologists at Hopkins, she really believes in CSEPs give, giving information about seizure networks. So she does very extensive stimulation. She will stimulate 30, 40 contacts. She'll spend an hour with the patient and therefore we get a lot of rich data responses to different stimulation points. So we're gonna add a stimulation term to our model, okay? And this will be our model and I'll talk about what our hypothesis was. So you might remember in, well, you guys, I don't know, maybe Dr. Gottman might remember in Japan, 1996, <laughs> around 700 children on one night were checked themselves into the ER all because they had seizures after watching a Pokemon episode. Did any of you hear about this? In that episode, there was a 12 hertz flashing light. Okay, so these kids ended up having what are called photosensitive epilepsy. A very particular stimulus, periodic stimulus at a particular frequency that triggers seizures. And in that case, it's a visual stimulus, photosensitive, right? And so actually I was a graduate student at this time and doing control theory, nothing in neuro, nothing, right? And I read this article and I was like, oh, resonance, that must be resonance, okay? I had no idea that in my future that would come back, okay? <laughs> so here's, here's the idea. So, so some of those of you who are not, you know, don't know about resonance, um, we experience it every day, that bridge, that collapse, it's not because of resonance, but um, so resonance um, is the following phenomenon. If I have a system, take a swing, okay? The actual physical spring has a natural frequency. So when you push your little sister or, you know, on the swing, you know that if you push too much, they're not gonna have a big swing amplitude. If you push uh, too slowly, they're also not gonna have an amplitude. But if you push at that natural frequency of the spring, they go flying, right? And that's what's called the resonant frequency. So if you were to plot the amplitude, the response of the swing, if amplitude versus the frequency that you're pushing at, you will see a peak at what's called that resonant natural frequency. And that's called resonance. Okay, bridges have that, suspension bridges have that. If you jump on the bridge, there's a certain frequency. If you jump at that frequency, it'll have high amplitude, okay? So here's what we were thinking. So we're thinking, okay, is it that if you have an epileptogenicity, if you have an onset zone, is that an area of the brain that if I were to trigger it with a, a, a stimulus, that it would have a resonance. And in particular, if I hit it at a specific frequency, would it cause a seizure? That was where we were going with this. So that was the question is, are high epileptogenic areas of the brain highly resonant? And I can only compute resonance from stimulation data, okay, response data. And the second, uh, she took it even further, my postdoc, she said, okay, if I can identify the resonant frequency, for a given channel, a given area from the data, data, can I then tell the clinician to go try it out and see if she can elicit seizures? And we did that. So we're gonna show. 
So that was the idea. Okay. So we thought red hypothesis with resonant regions correspond to seizure onset zone. And if that's true, we should be able to elicit a seizure with a periodic stimulus, the right place at the right frequency. Okay, so I'm gonna see what I can do to get you to the punchline faster. So the way we did this, okay, again, we're estimating models from data, okay? So this is just an example. Again, the clinician is literally putting a pulse, measuring the response, a pulse, measuring the response. So for every pulse, every channel she stimulates, she gets responses from everybody else. And what we're gonna do is for every time she stimulates a region, I'm going to build a model for that particular network, okay? So let's just see. So here's the model we built. So this is an example of what the receptor response might look like. This is typically like a two second window. And we're gonna build a simple linear time invariant model, 1A matrix, because it's just two seconds, plus a BU, where U is basically a sequence of zeros and then one where she hits. And she says pairwise channel, so we put one, one. Okay, so that's the B times the pulse, beautiful. And now I can estimate A and B from data for each channel that she stimulates, okay? Now what you can do with this model, and, and this is just showing that the model can reconstruct the data. So what we do with this model is, again, this is for the electrical engineers, is we can compute what's called a transfer function. From input U of T to my output, this case I have many outputs, X of T, so it's a single input to multiple outputs. Transfer, it's a, it's a vector of transfer functions, okay? And what we can do is once I have a transfer function, for those of you who know, I can actually draw what's called a Bode plot, which tells me what's the gain of that system, amplitude of output divided by amplitude of input, when I hit it with a periodic stimulus at any different, at every single frequency. Right? So what's for linear systems, for those who might know linear systems, or even if you don't, if I have a linear time invariant system, I can draw this whole plot just with one impulse response. I kick it with a pulse, I, I excite all the natural frequencies, I can draw this plot. That's what the clinician's doing. She's putting a pulse, I'm making an assumption that it's LTI, and I'm drawing the body plot. Okay? So with that said, the hypothesis is if she ha happens to stimulate an onset zone, I'm going to expect a peak. And if she doesn't stimulate onset zone, maybe I won't see this resonance phenomenon. That's the idea, okay? And so what she does is with data, I'm gonna go straight to an example. We did this on 32 patients where we're looking at all their CSEPs data, we're building body plots, multiple body plots per patient, and we're trying to find out which body plots have resonance and saying that's the seizure onset zone. Clinician go, June, go and stimulate and see if you can trigger a seizure, okay? So I apologize that I'm skipping through this, but I'm happy to share any papers. Um, this is just, this just shows you an example of what body plots look like. So this is a patient, this is the implantation map. The red body plots are the, when she stimulated onset zone, her own clinically annotated onset zone. You can see many of them are, have higher gain and have that more peaking resonance. And this is a case where in her onset zones, we didn't see resonance. We saw actually somewhere else resonance, okay? So we do a similar test of trying to see, can we see correspondence between body plot resonance and SOZ? So we do that. Now I'm just gonna show you the seizure triggering. So then what we did, so this is what we're doing now is when Dr. Kang is doing her normal stimulation, we were getting all the responses, she gives us a call. She, she says, you have a half an hour. And what we do is we process all that data, we compute all the body plots, we look at the, it's very manual now, we look at the body plots, we look for resonance, we write a list, we call her back and say, okay, June, we want you to stimulate this guy at this frequency, this guy at this frequency, this guy at this frequency, and we see what happens. And what happened is when we did step here are five patients, I think we have six in the paper, we were able to actually trigger not just a seizure, but the native seizure, meaning something that looked like the seizure during passive monitoring. In, in this case, four out of five, we actually were doing four out of six, it was a thing which was really surprising to June because she says when she just regularly does her SPEX or even functional mapping, they they don't, they don't rarely trigger seizures just without trying to, right? So she was really intrigued that we were able to trigger seizures um, with this approach. 
Um, and I think I'm gonna stop there. Just wanna acknowledge, so all of this work are my students and postdocs. So Adam Lee did fragility, Christine did sourcing, Rachel, which Dr. Bowman, you might know Rachel, mm -hmm. did all the neural resonance. And this is the neurosurgeon, all his, many of his patients, but he wasn't the only one. We worked with many clinicians. This is Dr. Kang, who does the single pulse electrical stimulation. Just wonderful, wonderful. It, you know, it's been amazing working with them. And without their trust in us with, you know, handing over the data we, and their input, they had a lot to do with the mathematics and the visuals that we should, I showed you that sourcing map where you have the nose. That was Sarah, the neurologist. She's a you know what? I think you need to show it like this. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is this was a teamwork. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we have time for very quick questions. Yes. Fascinating comment. Uh, I had uh, just two quick questions. First, how do you uh, you find that five hundred millisecond window with the yeah. maximum? Because I think it's very uh, important. Yeah. And the second question is that when you define the linear system. Uh, you, I think based on my experience, I've done a lot of uh, modeling of the EEG data. And the problem that I have is that we always ended up with a uh, homogeneous linear system. So the equations are going to be similar, and the, you can solve that system, get that linear system. So how do you deal with that? Do you have any problem with it or not? Okay, let me answer the first one, and then I want clarification sure. on the second. So the first question, how do we choose 500 milliseconds? Actually, um, we we published a conference paper on this where so so there it's a good question right if I pick too short of a window I'm probably not going to get a good enough estimate because I have more equations than unknown unknowns anyway right but if I go too far out I'm not going to be able to reconstruct because it's not linear so where is that sweet spot so what we did is we I mean on average these intracranial EG has between 50 to 80 typically channels good channels that are not removed for whatever reason. And if in that type of range, we found that 500 meets that criteria, we can actually accurately reconstruct. Okay, so it wasn't it wasn't done technically through some type of bound, a theoretical bound or anything. It was done more sort of heuristically by searching. And what we found though, we also do this approach on scalp EEG, many like 20 channels, 15 channels, that's a whole different ball game. And we're finding around 125 milliseconds is best for scalp EEG. So it depends on the modality, the temporal resolution of that modality, and number of channels, okay? So nothing scientific about that. Now, your second question, you're saying you do a lot of modeling, linear modeling. Are you from data? Are you, or are you just... EG data, yeah, basically. So EG data, what are you doing? You're actually building similar things? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. We are trying to reconstruct that A matrix, that okay. adjacent to matrix. Okay. And the problem that I have most of the time, the calculation of that, it's an optimization problem, right? Okay. Most of the time, because you have a slight noise, the only difference between neighboring channels, neighboring contact areas is just yeah. a small noise. So you have the homogeneous linear system and solving that system is almost impossible. Oh, right? okay. So so I, I understand. So in, in that case, in that extreme case, you're having rows that are linearly dependent. Yeah, we don't get that. But but we but but I'm happy to sit and if you if I have time I think I have time I can tell you how we do it with least squares they're not they're, the A matrices don't tend to be degenerate um, I don't know I mean I don't know what, how you're estimating or what you're optimizing so, um, I know Adam I don't think all of my students do, does apply sparse constraints and that might uh, play a role in making sure you don't get uh, you know linearly dependent rows. You're right in that that there are very correlated if they're right adjacent, but the A matrix rows are not identical. So what will happen is you might get an A matrix that is has a high condition number. So small perturbation will have a drop rank or something. That's what you're getting? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's probably not, a, a, I don't think you can really avoid that. If you want to try to avoid that, you can try skipping channels, right? So just take out channels that are highly correlated and just work with the things that look very yeah. uncorrelated. That's a, so basically, now what we are doing is that we are focusing on the areas, regions that just all keeping all the contact electrodes. Yeah. Because to avoid that, basically. To avoid it. So you can, you can do that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Are there questions from the chat? Uh, there are not. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? Yes, go ahead. Um, I also find your talk very fascinating. So um, I have two questions. So the first is that 
um, uh, out of curiosity for the resonance study, like if the doctor can use the right frequency and trigger the native seizure, mm -hmm. uh, do you expect to also see the right uh, kind of sync source transition that you see in the natural source? Uh, like what's the... We, we never, we have not looked at the source sync metric apps on C7. We haven't done that. So the difference is though, there's only one A matrix in the CSEPs model. So I'm only going to get one sync index for every single node. It's a little different than in Arictal where I get a whole sequence of, of indices, right? So I just get one number. So I so so when it says we could look at what sync index looks like before and then in response to, but that's a two-second response. I'll only get one number per channel. And, but it's interesting. We haven't looked at that yet. Perfect. Uh, and, that, and my second question is that um, for the sync and source index, since we are looking at influence, do, um, and the hypothesis is that during the rest, uh, the reason why there is no seizure is because there are other regions actively inhibit the seizure onset. Mm -hmm. um, I, is, I, I heard that um, like many of the inhibition come from the basal ganglia. So if we are only recording at the core text, um, mm -hmm. like with that means. So, it, so yeah, we didn't, we, like if it was basal ganglia, we don't get a lot of contact with basal ganglia. Do you think all. the new the, the, the depth electrode help? I think the depth, of, I mean, so we did do the sync index study, did include about 15 ECOG patients, and we didn't see, you know, that they performed poorly or this and that, the majority of we're seeing. But if, so here's the thing, we talked a little bit about this. If it's really, say, inhibition from another area that's not covered, Right, that's still again the sync index is also a relative measure. If it's talking to another region that then you know that has a similar, I don't know. I mean, it's a good question. Um, I don't have an answer except that maybe that influence is coming through another covered area. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. It was fantastic. Great. <laughs> There was one more question. On... What was it? You can ask. Uh, Kian, did you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, great talk. I, I really enjoyed it. I have a bit of a general curiosity question um, for you. So you mentioned at the um, end of the talk that you've had some clinicians participate in the, the mathematics of the study. Um, I was sort of wondering if you've noticed at Hopkins, maybe, or any other place you've really been, um, if in areas outside of neuroscience, you've really seen that same uh, acceptance towards uh, modeling and even wanting to engage in the modeling uh, themselves. Because I thought that was pretty cool when you mentioned that. So just a bit of a curiosity question. Yeah, no, that's great. I mean, yes, I'm okay. So it, it takes time. It took me years to develop these relationships. I would say the people who actually meet with me and my students, on a weekly, they don't necessarily have the background in the math. But what I found is they will engage you, they'll give you feedback on what they're seeing, they'll ask more questions when they can understand something about what the math is getting at, right? So with the fragility, the fragility mathematics is probably the most sophisticated out of mm -hmm. anything I Yeah, do. definitely. Because they have to understand stability, eigenvalues. Okay, now I'm perturbing the matrix. I'm moving the eigen. I mean, it's it's control theory, right? So, so how do I do it? I did it. I tried to get them on board with the concept with that visual. Exactly what I showed you with that two by two, it actually works really well with the clinicians. So what I found in my experience is when the clinicians understand what the math is doing and they kind of you know believe in the hypothesis, right? So the fragility hypothesis. At least they say, okay, Sri, that's plausible. That's plausible. One way to think about it is, yeah, I trigger something in the wrong place. It's going to cause instability. Okay, that makes sense to me, Sri. Okay, tell me more, right? So I think if you, so that's, I mean, even the sync index, right? Whether they believe it's inhibition or not, they were, they understood what we're trying to do and what the math is trying to capture. So I think the more you're able to communicate with them, whether they have a math background or not, and, and convince them of what the math is doing, I think they are more involved. Where they're less involved, I found out, if you try to do something like deep neural networks or something that is just almost like a pure machine learning pattern recognition approach, which just says, if I have enough data, I can do some wondrous things. Most clinicians will be, they might engage, but they won't 
not at this level, I don't think. That's been my thing. But then one of these surgeons, I mean, he went to MIT as an engineer. So <laughs> then you get those guys that are a little bit abnormal. <laughs> cool. Yeah, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Uh, we have for uh, all the students who have. Uh...